Hey, this is Dr. Ben White's host of the Rational Wellness Podcast. I talk to the leading health and nutrition experts and researchers in the field to bring you the latest in cutting edge health information. Subscribe to the Rational Wellness Podcast for weekly updates. And to learn more, check out my website, drwhites.com. Thanks for joining me and let's jump into the podcast. Hello, Rational Wellness Podcasters. Today, we will be discussing bioidentical hormone replacement therapy with Dr. Maggie Ney. Today, we'll be discussing the potential benefits and drawbacks of recommending hormone replacement therapy in postmenopausal women. After menopause, women often experience a number of symptoms, including hot flashes, night sweats, sleep problems, vaginal dryness, and atrophy. Postmenopausal women also have an increased risk of heart disease and osteoporosis. It was common for MDs to prescribe hormone replacement therapy prior to the Women's Health Initiative, which in 2002 reported that postmenopausal women who take hormone replacement therapy have an increased risk of heart attack, strokes, and breast cancer. After the Women's Health Initiative study was published, most MDs stopped prescribing hormones to postmenopausal women. However, additional analysis of this study has led quite a number of doctors and researchers to conclude that these conclusions may only apply to women who take estrogen derived from horse urine and synthetic progestins and who don't start taking hormones until an average of 10 years after menopause. We could probably add some more caveats to that as well. Um, Dr. Maggie Ney is a licensed naturopathic doctor and a Menopause Society certified practitioner. She's the director of the Women's Clinic at the Akasha Center for Integrative Medicine in Santa Monica, California, where she has been supporting women through perimenopause and menopause since 2006. Dr. Ney is co-founder of Hello Peri, an online resource for women going through perimenopause. And she's been featured on the doctor's show uh, and Goop for her expertise on women's health and hormones. Dr. Nay, thank you so much for joining us. Uh, thanks for having me. I'm happy to be here. That's great. So before we get into hormones, perhaps we could define a few of the terms like perimenopause and, and menopause. Absolutely. Yeah, it's a lot of confusion, especially since I've been really diving into perimenopause and talking about it more. A lot of people are like, what the heck's that? <laughs> so yeah, so menopause is technically one year since your last menstrual period. And the average age for most women is around 51 years old. But again, that definition of one year without your period is tricky if you don't have a uterus or if you've had, you know, if you're on an IUD or a uterine ablation, it gets a little confusing if you don't have your period as a barometer. So in that case, there's, you know, certain lab testing and we go by symptoms to kind of determine if you're in menopause. And specifically, if you're curious and you're not getting your period, generally two readings of an FSH over 35 and an estradiol you know, under 30 or so are pretty confirmatory that, that you're in menopause. But so technically menopause is one day, right? It's one year since your last menstrual period. Everything after that is, is considered postmenopause. I consider it the menopausal years because postmenopause kind of gives this idea and perpetuates this myth that menopause is over. <laughs> and, it, and maybe we'll talk more about that, but it's really you're living the rest of your life in these postmenopausal low hormone years. And that can have different, um, you know, symptoms and affect different, affects everyone a little differently. And then perimenopause is the time basically leading up to menopause. It's around menopause when hormones start to shift. They start to shift and it can be very subtle and it can be about, it can last for some people a decade before your final menstrual period. And I see perimenopause as this just forgotten neglected time for women where women are having all these new symptoms that they haven't had before. And then they see their healthcare practitioners who aren't really aware that these hormonal changes can be affecting their health and women feel unheard. And maybe they're referred to a psychiatrist, a gastroenterologist, a neurologist. I have so many people who've had all these specialists, cardiologists, and um, 
really it's these perimenopausal years. So it's like my mission, it's my joy, it's my passion to share this so that every woman is knowledgeable and empowered as they enter this time. And I should say some of the major symptoms of perimenopause, the main ones are your cycle starts to change a little bit. So, you know, and again, I divide perimenopause into kind of early and late. So early perimenopause, maybe you're starting to notice your cycle coming a day or two early, or you might be noticing a big one is like feeling less resilient, right? So the stress you used to be able to handle a lot, and now it just becomes too much. Like you don't bounce back as quickly or stressors that you used to be able to manage now just feel very overwhelming. And then as we get a little later into perimenopause, you might notice your cycles are skipping, you're getting more hot flashes and night sweats, vaginal dryness, but really there's like over 40 symptoms attributed to perimenopause and menopause. So, it, and it truly does affect everyone differently. Maybe you can highlight a few that are often overlooked. Yeah, I mean, I think I just really, the emotional piece is so huge. So depression, anxiety, I mean, 70% of women going through the menopause transition have some sort of mood change that's significant. And about 60% of women who have a history of depression will have a reoccurrence. So a lot of the mood symptoms, um, inability to sleep, so insomnia may be the first symptom to come up. But there's other ones, really, because there's estrogen and progesterone receptors all throughout our body. So joint pain, you can get tingling. I have someone with muscle twitches worsening headaches, worsening migraines, burning tongue, burning skin, itchy skin. There's a long list. So um, perimenopause, is is, is, uh, is progesterone the first hormone that really drops or is it estrogen? Yeah, I mean, really, we consider progesterone to be the first hormone to begin to drop during okay. early perimenopause. And so some of those symptoms can be a little bit more anxiety, difficulty sleeping, but also some more spotting or earlier menstrual bleeding, like a, your period coming a day or two early. Okay, yeah, because you mentioned measuring estrogen as a way to um, talk, to know if you're in perimenopause. What about measuring progesterone? So measuring, um, so I was speaking before about if you're unsure if you're in menopause and you're not getting your period. Oh, if you're in menopause. Oh, okay. Yeah. So, okay. Testing for hormones, again, during perimenopause is a little tricky because hormones do naturally fluctuate. Yeah, they're going so all you, over the place. Yeah. You don't need a blood test to diagnose you as being in perimenopause, which okay. again, is kind of controversial and I mean, controversial in the sense that some doctors are like, oh, your labs are fine. You can't be perimenopausal because you can have normal looking labs. But again, um, there are certain times of your cycle that if you're really trained in this, you can test and get an idea of where someone is. But you kind of with the perimenopause, you got to take it with a grain of salt because you can know from one cycle to another cycle, it can be vastly different. So if you're looking, you asked about progesterone, typically we would want to look about a week after you ovulate, which is generally a week before you expect to get your period. You can check your progesterone levels and you, you want to see it, you know, around 10 or above and you can really confirm ovulation. Sometimes during perimenopause, that will be lower, like seven or eight or five. You, you can tell you ovulated, but the production of progesterone is, is low. But I mean, really with perimenopause, while labs can be, you know, helpful and useful, it, it, it takes, it's your story, it's your symptoms, and it's working with a clean, uh, trained clinician who can really help guide you through this. Um, I talk to a lot of women that are afraid of taking hormones. They think they're going to have an increased risk of breast cancer. And uh, a lot of doctors are still not okay with prescribing hormones. So uh, what did we learn from the 2002 Women's Health Initiative? Um, is taking hormones going to increase a woman's risk of breast cancer, heart disease, and blood clots? All right. We learned a lot from the Women's Health Initiative. <laughs> and I will share just a personal story that the summer of 2002, which is when the Women's Health Initiative results were aired. I remember where I was. I don't know if you remember this, Ben, but I was, it was the summer before I started medical school. I was sitting on my mom's bed. I think I was watching Days of Our Lives and TV was interrupted. This was the age when <laughs> like we interrupt this television show for a word from your, you know, important word from your network. And it was, you know, someone standing up there saying, we are stopping women's health initiative start short. There's a higher rate of breast cancer, heart disease, stroke. It was scary. And I remember 
sitting there being like, thank goodness I'm going to naturopathic medical school. I can learn about all these other therapies. So as I was diving into this and looking at the research and following the research, we really know now that there were a lot of flaws to that study. So, I mean, we can spend probably hours unpacking it, but let's get started a little bit to what's most relevant. So prior to the Women's Health Initiative, most doctors were giving hormones because they were noticing their women, women were doing really well. They felt really good. And it seemed like there was less heart disease and women were living longer, but there were no double blind placebo controlled studies. So in came the Women's Health Initiative that started in the late nineties. And then was the first double blind placebo controlled study looking at hormones. So um, very big deal. It was stopped short a little bit after five years because of a higher incidence of breast cancer, heart disease, and stroke. Um, obviously big deal, but so now we go and we're, this, this announcement, I should say, came out before any doctor really had a chance to look at the study, but it did irreparable harm and has really, for a generation of women, we're still trying to, to educate women and doctors about bad hormone replacement therapy. So basically when we look at the study, there were some flaws in hindsight, like people criticize the study there. I mean, I think, um, there were a lot of good things we learned about hormones. A lot of the benefits we talk about hormones come from this study, but you got to look at where there were mistakes and errors. So first of all, because they knew that hormones really did help with symptoms like hot flashes and night sweats, and they were mostly concerned of like, hey, people are doing great. They're living longer. They have less heart disease. Like, does it really do this? So the average age of participant was much older. Most women did not have any symptoms. So the average age was about 63, which is not when most women start hormones. And then, and then if you look at, you know, a little bit more detailed, a lot of the women, like 70% were overweight, 60% were obese, where a lot of them were past smokers, a lot of them had hypertension. So there were some pre-existing cardiovascular conditions to begin with. And again, most women were older. And then you look at the forms of the hormones used. So the estrogen was uh, oral, uh, an oral estrogen. It was um, um, conjugated equine estrogen. So often labeled CEE or Premarin. And there were two groups to this study. There was this group of women that had a uterus and a group of women that did not have a uterus. Because we learned before the study that if you give estrogen alone to women with a uterus, you're increasing their chance of getting uterine cancer. But when you give progesterone or progestin or progestogen, progestogen is this umbrella term that encompasses progestin, which is a synthetic progesterone and a progesterone. But they discovered if you gave a progestin, that uterine cancer is, that risk is negated. So it's back to baseline. So they had a group of women who had a uterus, they were given Premarin, which is the conjugated equine horse urine metabolites of estrogen. And they were given Provera, which is an oral um, progestin, which really is not used much today. And the other arm of the study was just given Premarin. After five, a little after five years, um, they saw that there was a higher incidence of breast cancer. So more women were being diagnosed with breast cancer in the estrogen and progestin arm, not in the estrogen only, which is blows people's mind. So I'm going to say it again. The women who just took the Premarin actually had about 18% less breast cancer. So it wasn't the estrogen that we know. Estrogen does not cause breast cancer. So you look at the the arm that did have, it did show a little bit more, and I say a little. So um, I'm going to go into how the media took the data and really went wild with it. Now, let, let me just challenge you a sure. little bit, and not, not from that study, but um, to uh, some of the women's fears about taking estrogen is they've also heard that there's estrogen receptor positive breast cancer. And we also know that giving drugs to block estrogen is often a treatment for women with breast cancer. Yes. True. Very good point. And um, that makes a lot of sense, right? And, and intuitively, like, well, if you're, if you're taking a drug to block estrogen, why would given estrogen not cause an issue? So uh, breast cancer is very complicated. A lot of variables are involved. And um, certainly there are breast tumors that grow in the presence of estrogen. So giving estrogen would cause that tumor to grow, which is one argument of why you know, perhaps the tumors were showing up maybe a little earlier. I mean, because your your stimulus maybe was being diagnosed earlier, but um, estrogen doesn't cause the tumor to grow. But if you had a tumor 
that grew in the presence of estrogen, it could stimulate its growth. So what they found in the arm that took estrogen, the Premarin and the Provera was that there was about an 18, a, a higher, I'm no, sorry, there was a higher incidence of breast cancer diagnosis, not death, but diagnosis. So that stopped people short. And we also found in both groups that there was a higher incidence of heart disease and stroke. So in unpacking, let's talk a little bit about breast cancer because we know that with the estrogen only, there was a reduced risk. And with the estrogen, the Premarin and Provera, there's, there was a slight increased risk. So when we look at that arm, so then it, it seems logical, it was the, the Provera, the synthetic progesterone. And we know that Provera isn't as breast or metabolically friendly as our, our bioidentical or oral micronized progesterone. So that's that's one leading theory that why there was more breast cancer. And the other one, and this is um, Avram Blooming, who wrote Estrogen Matters, great book, but he talks about how in the control group, so the group that didn't have any hormones, but that was comparing to the people who took the Premarin and Provera, the people in that group actually had a history of taking hormones. So their baseline was actually lower. And when you take that into consideration, there oh, wasn't- interesting. Any, yeah, isn't that fascinating? Wow. So those, those are the two leading theories that it was the Provera or and or both, you know, that, that maybe the, the control group had a lower risk to begin with. Okay, so the, the, the news came out, 20 26% increase in breast cancer. Whoa, that sounds a lot, right? It sounds like one in four women got breast cancer. But that again is, again, when we look at the data, we're talking, there's this, we have to look at how the research and data is being presented. And there's this idea of absolute risk and relative risk when we're presenting and looking at research. And we know from the Women's Health Initiative, and at least that 26% increased risk of breast cancer that was on every newspaper and every newscaster, which sounds to me and everyone else like it's one in four woman, women, was the relative risk. The absolute risk is the actual number. And it was nine, after year five, nine extra women per 10,000 women that were diagnosed with breast cancer. So, okay, that comes to about one out of 1,000. Or women. So, you know, that's, I mean, every, every count, every patient counts like that's something one out of one person per 1000, but, but it's, it's not one out of four. Of, yeah. It certainly sounds a lot different <laughs> than one out of four. So it's the relative risk, absolute risk that really needs to be looked at when we're interpreting data. And we also know that oral estrogen tends to lead to blood clots, which is why um, very few um, uh, functional medicine integrative doctors are recommending oral estrogen. And yet I still see oral estrogen often when, when um, primary care doctors do recommend or when conventional doctors do recommend hormones, they typically use an oral estrogen still. Interesting. Yeah. I mean, the, or most, if they're going to use oral, they're usually not using Premarin anymore. They're using oral 17 beta estradiol or bioidentical estradiol. We know that oral estrogen from the Women's Health Initiative from um, does increase risk of blood clots. It's about when you take oral estrogen, like one out of a thousand women, extra cases of blood clot. It is significant it's because when you take oral estrogen, it has to be metabolized through the liver. And when it gets metabolized through the liver, it creates more clotting factors that increases your risk. I, I do always use transdermal. I mean, there's a few cases when oral, because transdermal isn't working, we might try oral. For the vast majority of women that have no health history, had no heart disease, who've, who've been pregnant, who've maybe been on the pill and have never had a clot, um, it actually could be okay. Um, but... Because you can be on hormone replacement for the rest of your life and risk of clot does increase as you get older. Why, why even, why start? It's the way I see. Like if it was a short term and for some women it is, but for most women, it's a life, it's a lifelong, you know, journey of being on hormones to optimize their health for women. So if it was a couple of years and oral was they want it because it's easy, you know, it's cool. But because it's a long time, I prefer just getting people started on the transdermal route. And there's a lot of options. So what are your favorite options? Well, I educate. I really do. I think um, this education piece of for women about what their options are is, is not often given. 
So you, we always use bioidentical hormones. So I should say that bioidentical hormones, it is for many conventional practitioners, it's cringy. They get, they, it causes this emotional reaction because they're like, it doesn't even mean anything. And I, I just had a whole discussion with my primary care doctor about that. You know, it doesn't really mean anything. I said, yes, like, it it's does. A true medical definition. And so some people just, just bioidentical, that term kind of came after the Women's Health Initiative. And it was came out as like, you're not using those, you're using something safer and more natural and so and then and that kind of led to more compounding pharmacies and like some pellets and anyway so the definitions has been a little um no one really knows what it means but i'll tell you what it really what it means for you know what, what when we're using it it's hormones that have the same molecular structure as our own hormones. right so and, and bio- con- conjugated equine estrogen is completely different completely different yet it combined to the same receptors, but it has a different response in the body. So bioidentical hormones, and this is important for that I think is often confused. There are FDA approved bioidentical hormone options that you can get through any pharmacy. And then there's compounding bioidentical hormones. Right. I educate people on both. And I think what I see most is that a lot of women think you can only get bioidenticals from compounding pharmacies. They do do compounding. I mean, you can, you can, but you can also get it from like your CVS or Rite Aid or Costco. Um, there's options. So the FDA approved options for estradiol can come in a patch, can come in a gel, can come in a spray, and can come in a ring. Okay. And then usually the bioidentical progesterone um, can come in as as an oral form, oral micronized progesterone. And then there's some combination patches that have the oral that have the transdermal estradiol combined with a progestin. Um, so not the bioidentical, but, but usually which, which one of the progestins like um, Levo and Gestrel and um, I'm blanking on the other one, but, but a, tra- a progestin combined with the bioidentical estradiol. So those are the FDA approved. And then there's a ring called the fem ring that delivers, you know, bioidentical estradiol. So you can get all those from your regular pharmacy. Compounding pharmacies, again, can deliver the estradiol and progesterone in various forms. I, I am a promoter of like oral my oral progesterone rather than the creams for the uterine protection. Um, right. So that it works really well. It also helps more with sleep and, you know, the nervous system response because of its increased risk, you know, increased production of or stimulating the GABA receptors. But right. the compounding estradiol, you know, it can come in a lozenge or a cream, comes in many different forms. So what's your favorite form of estro- estrogen to use? And and a lot of doctors who use compounded um, typically are using like the bias, which is a combination of estradiol and estriol. Yeah, I mean, my fa- I usually start with estradiol. I usually like the patch, to be honest with you. It's, it's well tolerated. It's covered by insurance. And um, it's been really easy for my patients. Some people, so that's usually what I'll start with. I'll usually start with the patch. And Prometrium or oral micronized progesterone, these are the FDA approved hormones. I usually start with that. I, I don't do as much bias. I used to when I first started out, did more bias. I don't anymore. I find that, you know, they use, they put, it's more harder to titrate. First, I, I don't know if it's really needed to add in that estriol. Like I think our body can convert estradiol to estriol with good liver function. I think estradiol is the one that has the most potent effect in the body. Well, the other reason for um, recommending the bias is is with the idea that the estriol is a weaker estrogen and maybe it makes it even safer. Exactly. That's the argument for the for the bias. It can yes. be hard to titrate because you're if you want to go up a little bit, then you're upping, you know, sometimes estriol can be at a higher dose. It might be too much. So I don't tend to go to bias. Okay. But it is an option. I, I mean, I have people who want it and we educate, I discuss pros and cons, and I certainly have some patients that are on it for sure. Okay. So you like the patch. What, what, what about some of the other forms? What about pellets? I'm not a fan of pellets personally, because okay. I see the women in my office that come in with side effects. They come in with their testosterone in the 200 range, you know, it really should be like under 70 and they're irritable and they're angry and their hair is falling out and they have acne and, and I can't do anything about it really. You know, I can support their liver. I can give them emotional support, but you really have to wait those like about three months. I know some people really love pellets. It's not something that I recommend because there is, a, I feel, a lack of safety data 
Um, and you're giving super physiological doses of these hormones. How do you feel about pellets, Ben? Um, I I think, uh, as you said, the, the problem is, is once you put the pellet in, if it turns out that it's it too much, there's nothing you can do about it until, you know, it takes like three months or so. So I think it's a problem. It, you know, I, I, I guess uh, some women like the pellets because they don't have to apply the cream. They don't have to worry about taking a pill every day. Um, and so you just forget about it. But um, I think if you are going to use pellets, you probably need to start low and slowly build it up but who wants to wait so yeah i i just don't do it i i don't like giving something that i can't reverse quickly right right and there is a a lot of women on pellets actually this don't know that there are other options that there's a lot that's not really an fda approved option i mean there's yeah it's something i don't feel comfortable doing i know that i've talked to women i was just at a talk this last weekend and some doctors on it and promoting it and it's something i just don't feel comfortable and you know what i my patients feel amazing right they i don't feel like i'm missing something in my toolbox to help people feel sensational my women feel amazing doing something safe and <laughs> studied right. and, and i feel good about that okay so when it comes to progesterone there's normal fluctuations in progesterone and typically progesterone is higher for two weeks out of the month. And so some doctors feel that you want to try to duplicate that natural rhythm of the body. So they'll give women progesterone for two weeks instead of every day. What do you think about that? I mean, that's, that's okay. So for let's divide it up into perimenopause and, and postmenopause. So yes, our natural cycle has progesterone that's being produced two weeks out of the month. So it does make sense. Like, why don't we just dose it and match the cycle that intuitively makes sense. I do present that to women, um, as an option because for the uterine protection, you really need it for like 12 days out of the month minimum. So a lot of women actually love their progesterone. Like they're sleeping better. They they want to take it every night, in which case, please take it. I usually give people the choice to see what resonates with them. I mean, you give women good information. They, they tend to are able to make it the decision that feels right to them. Um, so I usually present it as both. I There's no studies, you know, I do, I am research-based. Like there is no studies right. that say taking it two weeks out of the month is, is better than every day. So I do present the option. For some women, that idea of cycling it really resonates with them. Um, for other women, they actually don't like progesterone. A small percentage of women do feel worse on progesterone, in which case they want to take it for the fewer days of the month. Or So that's the option. And One of the downsides is you get your period back, right? No, you don't really when you're using You don't because we don't dose estrogen high enough. Like you have to go really high in estrogen oh, to really okay. get your period back. Yeah. But but there is maybe a more chance of spotting, right? Like spotting. The, okay, yeah. I see. Yeah. So if there certainly if you're finding that you're spotting, you know, we would definitely do it, you know, nightly to prevent that from happening. But the dose we use for hormone replacement technically is called MHT, menopause hormone therapy, because those doses are, are really quite low. Um, and then in perimenopause, again, I get the option. Sometimes cycling it can help elongate that luteal phase the last two weeks. You take it for a full two weeks, it can help stretch that cycle out. It can help prevent spotting. I often find that because the cycles are a little irregular, it gets to be kind of annoying for people and confusing of like, when do I start? When do I do it? Do I stop? I got my period three days. Early. So you, I usually will say, you know, totally fine. You can take it every day or just don't take it during your bleed week and then start taking it. It can be a little confusing during perimenopause when your cycles are irregular to cycle it. But some people do and, and they really like that. Now, for women who are taking uh, estrogen and progesterone daily, do you periodically give them a week off? I mean, again, individualized, not not routinely. Okay. Um, like I said, some if they're if they're getting their periods, you know, sometimes I, you know, we will say like just you know, you can take stop the hormones that week for some women, but you just certainly don't need to. Yeah, I guess the concept is, is, you know, because hormones normally fluctuate and now you're taking the same identical level of hormones every single day by not taking it for a week or somehow you're producing something that's more natural. Right, right. That's the idea. Really mimicking our body's natural right. cycle. Right. So, yes, you could you could take that bleed week off. You can then start up with estrogen and then add in progesterone for the second half of your cycle. Oh, you know, again, I do discuss that as an option. A lot of women just feel so much better 
um, on the hormones. So they want to take it. And I, I think it's safe. Like the research is daily. So it, it does, doesn't show any difference in safety data, but I, I understand that 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 idea of matching the cycle resonates with a lot of women. But I should also say, and especially during perimenopause, we can have worse symptoms when our estrogen levels drop, right? Like headaches, worsening hot flashes. And some of that happens on the first few days of your cycle, in which case sometimes for women who get that headache during perimenopause, right before their cycle, a little transdermal estrogen getting into your period can actually be really helpful because it just get cuts that keeps that it's the drop in estrogen for many women that can that trigger a headache. And that happens before your period. So you give a woman a real low dose estradiol level during that drop and, and some of the headaches can the headaches can go away. Do you have any women just taking progesterone only? Totally. Yes. So, you know, during both during peri and postmenopause, I like to stagger in producing hormones so women can know how it's affecting their body individually. So generally during perimenopause, especially early perimenopause, sometimes progesterone is all you need. I have a lot of women just on progesterone. If they have heavy menstrual flow, spotting, insomnia, the progesterone can be all you need. Um, what do you think about a woman in her 70s uh, take who wants to initiate hormone replacement um, either because they, they're still having hot flashes or they want to prevent Alzheimer's or they, they're still having trouble sleeping. Yeah. I mean, unfortunately, there's like a massive group of women who were really denied this option. And now with more education coming out with you to having more women talking about it, we were like, what the heck? I missed out. I want it. It's a different conversation. It's a different conversation than what I'm having with you because right now I'm going to answer your question, but I'll step back and say what we know is that when you start within the first 10 years of your last menstrual period or generally before age 60, women have less risk of heart disease, less risk of diabetes. They live longer, 30% longer, perhaps because of the less risk of heart disease, which right. is the number one killer of women. And what we what we know, and, and even the research with brain health, it's really about starting early because of two theories, um, the timing hypothesis, right? Which is like, right. if you, this is, there's this optimal window of starting, which is why I'm so passionate about educating perimenopausal women. So they have all the information before they sometimes even get to the point of needing it because right. there is this optimal limit. Your hormones are good for you when your cells are healthy, when your vasculature is healthy. So it's like this, it's called um, timing hypothesis. So you want to start within the first 10 years of menopause or healthy cell bias, which is like, Hormones are good when your cells are in, and vasculature are healthy, but they can start to potentially lead to symptoms when you go longer without your body seeing hormones. So the conversation is definitely different if I'm talking to a 70-year-old woman. You're, by that time, we know that hormones can actually increase your risk of strokes. And the data is a little nuanced, but it seems to not be as good for brain health. And I think it all just comes down to the vasculature. When you Estrogen is so good at keeping our, our blood vessels buoyant and helping produce nitric oxide. And then when you go a long time without seeing estrogen, they, they can get developed more plaque, which naturally happens with age, get a little harder. And then it seems that when you introduce estrogen later, after that 10 year window, it has a more pro, instead of the normal anti-inflammatory effect, it has more of a pro-inflammatory effect. It kind of shakes things up a little. The vessels are like, ooh, what's going on? You know, what's going on? Hello, they haven't seen estrogen in so long. And sometimes those little plaques can be, you know, chipped off a, a, vas a vessel and can lead to the strokes or heart attack. The risk is not huge. Yeah, I, I did hear somebody discussing the, the concept that um, plaques might become softened and, and unstable as a result of introducing estrogen. Yes, I will say the risk is like highest in the first year, and then it doesn't just increase the longer you take hormones. It's really like, I think it's the first six to 12 months that the risk of, of an adverse effect like that happening. So it's a different conversation. The benefits aren't as big, the risks are greater. Um, and then of course, if we, it's, I really believe in shared decision-making. Um, I give my opinion, I go over all the research and together we make a decision that feels right for the person when they understand risk benefits, you know, you, you right. women can make the best decision for themselves and I, and I support them. Yeah, Dr. Dale Bredesen has, who, who's a neurologist who's pioneered a functional medicine integrative approach to um, preventing and reversing Alzheimer's, is finding that using hormone replacement, even in women in their later years, initiating it then can be very helpful for brain health. 
Yeah, no, I've, I've heard that. I've heard that from him. And yeah, estrogen does help brain cells, neuroplasticity. So that he's, he's really pioneering that. Right. Yeah. Um, uh, let's see. Um, what is, oh, uh, for women who never took hormones, but they want to do something about the vaginal symptoms, the dryness, the atrophy, what do you recommend for that? Okay. Such a good question. So under talked about and appreciated <laughs> in the medical community, vaginal estrogen, well, there's a few options, but I'm just going to say it. vaginal estrogen is good for all women. Every woman will experience changes in their vulva, vestibule, vaginal tissue. It can affect the bladder. So sometimes if a woman's only having those some vaginal symptoms, then you can give local estrogen. You could also get, there's a lot of options. So estradiol, estriol. Yeah, either one. So the FDA approved, let's go through the FDA and the compounding. I definitely use both here. Um, the FDA approved, there's a vaginal cream, which works beautifully. I would like to share with people, the general recommendation is to insert it vaginally. I always have people put it on the outside too. That's what's so great about the cream is you can like massage it into your labia and your clitoris, your urethra, and it really can be beneficial. Um, so there's a vaginal um, estradiol cream, very low dose. There is tablets that you can insert in vaginally. Again, that doesn't always address the outside. So sometimes um, I'll, if someone doesn't like the leaking with the cream when they put it inside, I'll have them do the tablet inside and the estrogen on the outside, the cream on the outside. There's um, there's a ring, a string, which works, a set it and forget it. You know, you put it in for three months and take it out and that helps. And that's the local one. There's the fem ring that's systemic estradiol, but the S ring is local est estradiol. Again, even with that, I still will have encourage people to put a little cream on just the outside. Um, and there is now a FDA approved form of DHEA. Um, right. I was going to ask about that. Yeah. Yeah. So great. So our vaginal tissue is loaded with um, estrogen and testosterone receptors. There's, and there's even one DHEA uh, vaginal product that's over the counter. I know. I heard actually, I wasn't, I think you had someone on your podcast. Yes, yes, and yes. And I was like, oh my God, what is that product? So Fiona I, McCullough. Yeah, she was talking about, I got to find that. I know that also there's um a doctor who sells a cream that has a DHA in it. So there are some over-the-counter options. Yes. Um, so what DHA does, some people are drawn to, well, sometimes DHA, the androgen, which is considered, an androgen is like to DHA, testosterone. It's considered the male hormones, which is just wrong because women have plenty of it and need it. Um, but sometimes that works better for women. Women need that. They respond better. So um, the DHEA vaginally gets absorbed and then the cells makes estrogen and testosterone. Yeah, so, it's it's the bez Wecken DHEA um, uh, cubes. Okay, amazing. I mean, yeah, how much DHEA is in there? B-E-Z-W-E-C-K-E-N. I mean, do you know how much DHEA does it say is in there or does it just say it? Uh, I'm looking we can look in, later. Yeah, it's cocoa butter, DHEA, vitamin E, beeswax. Yeah, um, some nice soothing ingredients. Yeah, so the one that's FDA approved is 6.5 milligrams. You do it nightly. Um, there's also an estradiol um, ovule or insert that kind of has it's with cocoa butter too. So it can melt a little, address the outside. Those are all FDA approved options. Compounding, you can get that estriol. Estriol, again, is that hormone we talked about that's a little weaker. Um, yeah, it and, looks like 13 milligrams of DHEA. Oh, okay. All right. Um, um, I, there's also a vaginal testosterone. Yes. Um, not over the counter? Or, I mean, I prescribe no. it. Through, yeah, yeah, not so over the counter. Compounding but, pharmacy. Yeah. If you're a compounding pharmacy, oh, it can be so helpful for women that test their, again, our it's like really the lower third of our vaginal canal is just loaded with testosterone receptors. And so that adding that to a little estradiol or a little estriol, you do have to get it compounded can be such, um, such a powerful therapy to address the, the dryness and, and sexual discomfort, because really no woman should have to go through that. And no, it, it doesn't have to be this normal part of aging. There are so many options also increase urinary tract infections, which we see, with women during this time can be due to the lower estrogen. So um, really right. supporting that is important. And hyaluronic acid can also be beneficial for lubrication. 
Yeah. So hyaluronic acid helps to retain moisture. So it can be very helpful. And you can get through a compounding pharmacy, you can compound like estriol with hyaluronic acid. And it's it's a nice addition. It's It works beautifully. Right. Okay, cool. Um, so how do we track hormones? What's the best way to test for hormones? So <clears throat> during post menopause, let's break it up into peri and post. So okay. um, during perimenopause, you know, our hormones fluctuate so much that it's, you don't really, I mean, I, I always do get a baseline, but it, you don't need to, I should say, get that baseline because they do change so much and you can go by symptoms and, and see how a woman feels. But, but generally, if you want to kind of get an idea where your hormones are at, you know, the second or third day of your cycle, you can get a, a hormone panel. Generally, progesterone will be low there. I see so many women who are like, look, I have no progesterone. Help me. And I'm like, but this was done on a part of your cycle when you don't make any. I can't tell you how many times. I even have to correct doctors on that. And then, um, so you do hormone second, third day. That's because that FSH, that follicle stimulating hormone, um, that's the time of the cycle where if there is decreased egg quality, egg reserve, or you're approaching perimenopause, that FSH starts to increase. So generally, if your FSH is above 10 on that second or third day of your cycle, you can assume you're in this process. But next cycle, it could be normal. The other cycle, another cycle could be super high. Um, it does fluctuate a lot. And then in and, and the best day to test to manage progesterone? It's generally a week after you ovulate or a week before you expect to get your period. So if you have a 28 day cycle, generally like day 21, 19, 20, 21, right. 22 is that window where you can look at progesterone Right. and you can confirm ovulation, which is really helpful because some women don't know if they're ovulating. So that's an easy test to do. And we have different ways of testing hormones. We have serum, we have blood spot, we have urine, we have um, saliva. Yes, we do. <laughs> <laughs> and, um, you know, I think every pa practitioner feels strongly or maybe not about this or has their test they really like. Um, I I tend to do blood. You know, it's it's easy. They have solid reference ranges. There's pros and cons. I know that saliva can look more at the bioavailable hormone. Um, the urine test, which I'll use sometimes, looks at how you're metabolizing hormones. But I will say, you know, in my clinical experience, because I've been doing this like for 18 years and I've dabbled with all of those tests, I really find that, you know, listening to this, someone's story, getting them feeling amazing, getting them on hormones, I don't really need, I don't need it. And they're out of pocket expenses. And I know that people will argue with this with me. I've had big discussions with people, you know, that I should be doing the Dutch test on everyone. But, you know, if someone's feeling amazing and I can assess like breast tenderness, you know, you know, any of these symptoms that suggest that I need to really dive deeper. Sometimes if I'm re reaching obstacles, like for someone feeling sensational, really, um, maybe I'll do it to see what's going on. But overall, I can learn a lot from symptoms. I understand some of the therapies that might be used if you push down the two, the 16, the four pathway to support COMT. You can gain so much from someone's story like I just don't want to devalue that and and their symptoms and the dose you're putting on someone that I often find that I just don't need it and some people want it because they're so educated they listen they know what it can provide and we do it and I, I can analyze the test but I haven't found for me personally that it's been a game changer that I've needed it to really help people um, get to hormonal balance I do look at the gut microbiome like that's huge um, so yeah, I usually do blood unless I really am like, what's going on here? I'm, I'm reaching like this obstacle, then I may do one of the more functional tests, but it's covered by insurance. It's pretty easy. I do let people know, you know, everything that, again, I do a lot of educating, let people know of all the tests. I don't get a lot of pushback. People feel good. People feel good. So um, besides prescribing estrogen and progesterone for women, uh, menopausal women, do you ever prescribe testosterone, DHEA, pregnenolone, oxytocin? I do prescribe testosterone. I okay. usually don't start. I usually start like estrogen, progesterone, because that can in fact affect testosterone levels. And I see how women do, but I will prescribe testosterone. It's not, you know, it's crazy, but it's not FDA approved for women, even though it's such an important hormone for energy, mood, metabolism, brain health, musculoskeletal health, bone health but it's not FDA approved for women. So, um, 
I will recommend it. I do get it compounded. You have two choices when it comes to treating with testosterone. You can use the FDA approved option for men, androgel at one tenth the dose. Women okay. don't like that. It's confusing. And um, <laughs> so I get it. Everyone's like, just get comp. I always educate, but yes, I'll usually get a compounded testosterone cream. Okay. Um, I do test for testosterone. Um, just to, I, I do want the baseline. And it is a controlled substance too. So you kind of need that, that data, but I, I prescribe testosterone a lot for women and then DHEA. Yes. Um, I, again, test and, and, and see if they are low. So generally if it's like under a hundred, you know, I may give a little DHEA. It's, it's one of those things that's not as well researched. Um, we, there is some data in animals and, and elderly that it does increase, um, um, longevity and well being. It is a precursor hormone, right? Like that's for right. sure. We know it works vaginally. It can. Yeah, it was it was included in that Fahey study. That was the first study that showed a reversal of epigenetic aging. Yeah, yeah, it has definitely. I consider it almost like this indirect biomarker of the aging process because I mean, it's it's interesting when you start testing people. Some people are in twenties and thirties, and it's like let's just get that up there, you know. I, I don't, I think the issue with this DHA, which I find interesting is that it's available over the counter. I mean, great. I think all options should be available, but at like 50 milligrams, you could easily get that. And that to me is too high to start a woman on. Oh, my you, you can get it at five, 10. Yeah. Right. But, but it's available. So some women reach for that. Oh, first. okay. So yeah. I'd like to just educate, Hey, if you're a woman, start with a five or 10 milligrams. Right. Just, that's sure. the place to start. Yeah. yeah. I have seen side effects at too high of a dose, like anger, irritability, or acne. So I just like to educate women on that. But overall, I either see people who don't notice a difference, you know, or or they notice that they have even more energy, more stamina with the DHEA. But sure, it is something I'll, I'll try for women when they test, you know, you generally under 100 and I'll, I'll give a little DHEA and see how they respond. Is there a benefit to pregnenolone? Some doctors love pregnenolone. I, I just don't use it a lot. <laughs> Okay. I, know, I know that there are, um, and, it you know, it, it also depends on whether or not you test for it. So, you know, true. true. I don't always test for it. Um, what is your, what do you, do you use pregnenolone a lot? Well, as a chiropractor, right. Yeah. We can't prescribe anything, but pregnenolone is available over the counter. So we it do is. use it sometimes. Yeah. Some of my patients notice they, when, when we do use it, they notice um, better, mood, like, uh, I kind of feel like it sort of rounds out the whole hormone picture as a precursor, you know? Yeah, it definitely makes sense like that. Yeah. And, and I, again, it's not one of my go-tos, but I have patients on it. I have dabbled in it. It's just not usually something I, it's my go-to. Right. Okay. Um, let's see. What about nutritional supplements for women in menopause? Yeah, again, very individualized, but generally my, I really like, well, mitochondria support. I do like, cause really important for healthy aging. It's important for hormones and cellular energy, cellular health. So I love, um, you know, supporting the mitochondria generally like a B vitamin, I find helpful, a magnesium, I find helpful and, um, you know, some sort of adrenal adaptogen, I think it's helpful, like, like maca or ashwagandha. I like that as a baseline. I also, you know, vitamin D levels, most people need to be on like a maintenance dose of vitamin D to keep levels optimized and like an omega-3 fatty acid. What, what do you like for a, a typical uh, maintenance level for vitamin D? I mean, uh, 50 to 70, 50 to 80 around there. Oh, you talk about blood levels, right? And oh, I'm you, sorry, you meant dosing Yeah, levels? like, yeah, dosing like 5,000, 2,000. I find that it's individualized, to be honest with you. Yeah. I, I will track people and figure out what we need to do. So it's either 2,000 or 5,000. I right. think some people don't take it every day too. So I, I track them and, and I'm like, what are you taking? Okay, keep taking that. Right. Um, if they start to get a little higher, like above 60, 70, I'll definitely move them to 2,000. I mean, during COVID, I don't know if you were doing, seeing this, but I saw people with way too high vitamin D levels, like in, way above 100. So I had to bring them down people are really loading up on D but yeah you want to be in that optimal range it is not a water soluble vitamin it's a fat soluble vitamin so it can get stored in the fat and when it's way too high like when it's above 100 it can lead to symptoms so you, it is something you do want to track if someone's taking like you just want to make sure 5,000 most of the time 5,000 is great for a maintenance dose but right. for some people it's too high and 2,000 is the safe one and if you're not testing generally 2,000 right sometimes 5,000 is not enough I know for me I I, if I only take 5,000, it drops to like in the 40s or, or low 50s. So 
I got, I got to. That is why testing can be really helpful. Exactly. I'm a big, big proponent of testing, not guessing. Yeah, absolutely. For certainly for these nutrient levels. Now, now some doctors who prescribe bioidentical hormones automatically put women on some of the supplements like DIM to increase the potential that it's going to be metabolized safely. Yeah, I don't, I don't, I do use DIM. It's not like you're on hormones, I put you on DIM. And this is sometimes where the Dutch test can be helpful, you know, so you can really test not guess, right? Like you can right. really see what pathway you're going down the two, the four, the 16. And and the, what DIM does is it helps convert that to pathway, which is the safe, safest pathway. And that's the pathway we want to, I mean, all pathways, we're going to go down all of them, but certainly if you're really heavy in the four, which is the one right. that's the oxidative damage, DNA right. damage, you want to push the two. Right. Giving DIM just for everyone, it does lower estrogen levels. So you just want to be mindful of that. It seems like, right. everyone, like everyone should take DIM. But like if you're not on hormones um, and you're menopausal, you probably don't need DIM because it just can pull out whatever estrogen you have and make it even lower. Right. Sometimes without testing, if I see someone who's having the started hormones and they're kind of getting used to it and they feel really good, but they have this like breast tenderness and lowering the estrogen is not really the best choice. I'll, I'll do a trial of DIM and, and people really, and, and people respond well. So, so DIM is something that, you know, comfortably testing is nice to know if you, you actually do need it. Um, but, um, you know, we're looking at estrogen metabolism. You want to be having day, I st- you know, there's a lot you can do lifestyle wise to promote these healthy pathways. And I always will emphasize that too. If you want to be having daily well-formed bowel movements, you shouldn't be bloated or gassy or burping. You know, you should have really good digestion. That says a lot about your gut microbiome, which is really important for metabolizing estrogen. Um, you know, diets high in the cruciferous vegetables, which is the precursor to DIM, right? The indole carbonyl, which is found in the broccoli and cauliflower. All of that really helps with phase one. I encourage women to have broccoli sprouts, which is the sulforaphane, which helps with phase two. So I'm always doing those baseline lifestyle pieces to help with estrogen metabolism. Right. Uh, I'm starting to see estrogen and progesterone over the counter now. Yeah, I don't, I know progesterone cream you can get over the counter. I've seen estrogen now over the counter, one of the popular supplement manufacturers. And I was, I was kind of surprised. Yeah, I don't, don't, I know I've seen like some estriol, like I think in some of the Bezwek and I don't know, I probably need to double check that, but there is some estriol over the counter that can be, that I know is available. I don't know much about estriol. I'll have to see what these products are. Yeah. Okay. Um, So I I think those are the questions I have. Any other things you want to tell our viewers and listeners and then tell us uh, how we can get in touch with you? Yes. So, you know, I, I want all women to know that they have a toolkit of treatment options. And I want women to know that it's, this is a normal process. Um, this is not a disease state, but it does, it does require a check-in. And um, I want women to know that you can continue to age with the same level of energy and vitality and libido and feel really amazing, but how we treat our body does change. So we need to, you know, really, really emphasize those lifestyle pieces become even more important. And we have a suitcase of tools to address perimenopause and menopause from nutrition and sleep to supplements and microbiome support. There's so much and hormones. So I want people to know there's options not to, this is not something they need to suffer through and deal with. And because I think when you feel your best, like you can truly get after all the things in life that light you up. And that is my, why I want people to not just be, I don't want their health to be an obstacle to achieving what they want in life. And when you feel good, you can really get after it. And I do think this is a, this is our time, right? Like maybe the kids are older. Um, we have a little bit more time and this is our time to step into our passion and really get after it. But geez, it really helps when we feel good and our hormones are balanced. So that's really what I want all women to walk away with is knowing there's options and that that they get to write their own script, that they don't have to live someone else's script. They can live the life of their dreams. That's great. And how how can uh, viewers uh, get a hold of you if they want to seek you out? Yeah, so I um, I have a private pa- practice at the Akasha Center for Integrative Medicine, which is in Santa Monica. And I see, I'm licensed in the state of California. I see patients all over for educational, um, for telemedicine. I have a big telemedicine practice um, as far as like 
you know, prescribing and all of that in the state of California. I see women all over California. Um, so that's at the Akasha Center for Integrative Medicine. I also co-founded Hello Perry, which we're on Instagram at the Hello Perry, which has a lot of information on menopause, perimenopause, everything that has to do that. So you can find me there. On Facebook, great. I think we're at the Hello Perry as well. Okay. Thank you, Dr. Nay. Thank you so much for having me on. This was so fun. And for anyone listening, questions, please feel free to DM me. I love to connect with everyone. Thank you for making it all the way through this episode of the Rational Wellness Podcast. For those of you who enjoy listening to the Rational Wellness Podcast, I would certainly appreciate it if you could go to Apple Podcasts or Spotify and give us a five-star ratings and review. That way, more people will discover the Rational Wellness Podcast. And I wanted to let everybody know that I do have some openings for new patients so I can see you for a functional medicine consultation for specific health issues like gut problems, autoimmune diseases, cardiometabolic conditions, or for an executive health screen or, and to help you promote longevity and take a deeper dive into some of those factors that can lead to chronic diseases along the way. Um, and that usually means we're going to do um, some more detailed lab work, stool testing, sometimes urine testing. Um, and we're going to look at uh, a lot more details to get a, a better picture of your overall health from a preventative functional medicine perspective. So if you're interested, please call my Santa Monica White Sports Chiropractic and Nutrition Office at 310-395-3111 and we can set you up for a new consultation for functional medicine. I'll talk to everybody next week.